In 2002, I decided to follow my bliss and to embody the spirit of Henry David Thoreau and advance confidently in the direction of my dreams, endeavoring to live the life that I'd always imagined. But instead of being met with a success unexpected in common hours, as Thoreau put it, I was met with massive failure and rejection unimagined in your worst nightmare in the midnight hour. You see, after I completed my PhD related to critical future studies in 2006, I was rejected by every university job I applied to, including failing a heartbreaking 16 successive job interviews over the following decade. So no, this video isn't about how to ace job interviews, nor how to write a job application, since I wrote several hundred of them and got little more than sore typing fingers. Both of them. Hello, I'm Mark St. Anthony, and today I'm a pretty successful academic and futurist, if I do say so myself, regularly speaking at international conferences worldwide and writing books and articles that I love to write, not to mention teaching some cool courses at the Beijing Institute of Technology here in Zhuhai, China. Courses like Artificial Intelligence and the Future of the Mind and Leading the Future. So, in the end, it seems Thoreau's wisdom has turned out to be largely true, but boy, it was tough going back there. In my previous video, I outlined some of that journey and identified three key principles about living your bliss. Lessons I learned from my own bumpy experience. You might like to watch that video before or after this one, but in this video, I'm going to clarify a further five key lessons I learned, tell you a few more terrible tales and some nice ones. My goal is to help you learn from my experience and live the life you're imagining so that you can avoid some of the huge holes I fell into. In my last video, I mentioned how devastated I was when I was rejected for a top job at a leading Singaporean university, some five years after gaining my doctorate, even though they flew me over there and paid for everything. At the time, I was still working as a humble high school teacher in Hong Kong, a great job, but no longer my passion. So it was, not that long after, in 2012, I quit my comfortable job, a well-paid teacher's job in Hong Kong, and went back to live in Melbourne, Australia, in my mid-40s, and while making the huge mistake of not first having a job to go back to. That's not one of my key insights, by the way. Don't do that. To my horror, I soon discovered that it cost 14 bucks in Australia to buy a measly chicken sandwich in a coffee shop. And my Chinese wife and I couldn't even afford to rent a house in Melbourne, let alone buy one. And we ended up renting a single room with an ensuite in someone else's house. Now, I'm no meteorologist, but in my unprofessional assessment, Melbourne's weather fits rather nicely into the shitty subcategory. I fondly remember one winter's evening, the owner of the house we were sharing telling me that I could not turn on the oil heater in my own room because it would add 400 bucks to the electricity bill. I literally had to wear two pairs of trousers, two shirts, a jumper, and a thick coat inside the house. And when it got unbearable, I went outside, sat in the car, and turned the engine heater on. No, nope, I'm not making this up just to make myself look like a pathetic loser. But the truth is, I didn't just sit in my car to keep warm. It was often because I needed a personal space to release the strong emotions I was experiencing at the time, including anger, fear, shame, and grief. I adopted this emotional alignment process from several of my spiritual teachers, and I still use it today when required, especially after watching the Australian rugby team play. The process permits the full honoring of emotions and thoughts as they arise within the mind and body. And there was no way I could do that inside the house with the owner and my wife there. They would have called the man in white coats around to drag me away to a special cell with unfeasibly comfortable walls. And sorry to offend Don Johnson fans. Remember him, Miami Vice. But tight white coats just aren't my style. What I'd like you to understand is that even though I was allowing this traumatized part of myself to freely express itself, I did so as the witness to this suffering. I was maintaining a conscious relationship with my emotional body and the ego, bringing this part of me with me, just as a parent might hold the hand of a distort child. My pain did not define me. There was a deep connection between my emotional body and my spiritual self, but also an appropriate distance. 
So yes, I experienced sadness, anger, shame, and a certain diminishment at the level of mind, but I knew that was not who I was. And this is something that those viewers who are part of the trauma or healing movement might like to be mindful of. There are certain groups and individuals within the trauma movement today which either openly or unconsciously encourage people to identify with their ego and its story of suffering. Sometimes these groups and leaders even sacralize suffering. But you'll never heal if your mind identifies with its own pain and the story of itself as a victim, as the oppressed. About the only purpose of the ego stories is to bring them into full awareness, examine why we've become attached to them and move beyond them. And then to create a new story, one more fully aligned with the deep self. Consider that my fourth key insight on your road to bliss. So yes, my long period of failure and rejection was tough, indeed heartbreaking at times, but that experience didn't define me. Though I experienced self-doubt, it never broke me. Importantly, despite my many setbacks over that long stretch of time, I did keep doing my own thing as a rather wacky futurist, focusing upon the futures of consciousness, humanity and technology. During the period from 2002 up to about 2015, I wrote perhaps 50 academic papers and book chapters, published 10 books, mostly self-published, presented at multiple academic conferences, all at my own time and expense. As I had no sponsor, and all this work, despite the backstory of repeated failure and rejection from universities, was very slowly building me a legitimate knowledge base, a name, and very importantly, personal and professional connections in the very fields I was exploring. For example, I presented regularly at the Asia Professional Futures Network, the Society for Consciousness, based in the USA, and various academic organizations in Australia. I kept expanding my networks and regularly kept taking what I call wise actions based on my integrated intelligence. Sometimes I got what I wanted, a lot of times I didn't, but I kept going, kept moving, kept learning. Yes, I was set adrift in a sea of uncertainty, sailing the murky waters of ambiguity outside the system, seemingly abandoned. But the truth is that this professional freedom enabled me to write research and speak on the topics I chose, those that were aligned with my deep self and which inspired me deeply. For example, in my freelance work, I was regularly bringing in ideas from futurists, from various spiritual and awakening traditions, from rogue scientists, and even from the freaky folks of parapsychology. I weaved all this together with ethnographic perspectives. That means talking about my own personal experience because I'd also invested an enormous amount of time and energy into working with my own mind on my own healing issues and in expressing firsthand the frontiers of human consciousness. The latter I often did together with other like-minded explorers of the psyche and from all this inner work I had learned an enormous amount about myself, about the human condition and the forces which animate us. Crucially, it was the fact that I was outside the institutions of learning that enabled me to explore these domains of knowledge. That was some gift, although it didn't always look like it at the time. The key is, if you find yourself outside the system, don't take an attitude of opposition towards it. Don't hate the people stuck in it. Make connections, not enemies. Be a creator, not a destroyer. Use your position of freedom to your advantage and use the system wisely to change the system because if you burn all your bridges there's no way back yep that's key insight number six and now at this point please allow me to introduce one more crucial distinction one that is very 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 ordinary and this one is for all you law of attraction folks out there conscious intentionality does not necessarily usurp the norms of society nor the laws of the market. Looking back, perhaps the key turning point in my journey from success to failure was getting a basic qualification in a skill that served the market. Heavy concept, bra. For in 2014, and this was getting near the end of my long, long limbo phase, I flew from miserable Melbourne to bustling Bangkok to do a special one month training course, the CELTA the Cambridge English Language Training Certificate for Adults. And I'm delighted to report that I passed the course with flailing colours, almost flunking out as a matter of fact. 
as mentioned in some detail in this previous video. But I persisted and that little bit of paper immediately led to my landing a short-term contract at Trinity House at the University of Melbourne as a humble ESL lecturer. Finally, I was a university teacher in my late 40s. Yes, better late than never, as they say in the classics. That was an exciting outcome and a painful lesson for I realized only then that in terms of gaining a university position, a basic training certificate had been far more useful than a full doctoral degree related to integrated intelligence. Those graduating with honors in Mesopotamian, fiddlestick design and the like, please take note. But the universe wasn't quite done yet with beating me about the head and body. Sadly, that position at the University of Melbourne lasted only about seven months. And after the contract period ended, I had to wait another three months without pay to see if they would employ me for the following year. I decided that was a total BS arrangement and took on another short term position, which then led to my being offered a position as director of studies of a prestigious international program in Guangzhou, China. It seemed that things were finally beginning to click. It wasn't a university job, but it was a position of some status. My ego instantly expanded to several times its normal size, but you guessed it, what expands must deflate. And after two months as Mr. Big Shot Director, and on the final day of my probation period of my contract, there came an ominous knock on my office door. Now, up to this point, my job had been going well, or so I thought, but on this day, the business owner, who I had never met and who had nothing to do with my being hired, huffed into my office and immediately began yelling at me. Now just imagine what Margaret Thatcher would look like and behave like if she was Chinese. She made up some ridiculous claims about my unsatisfactory work performance, all of which were completely baseless. And she fired me on the spot, ordering me to clear my things out of the office. But wait. One day later, she phoned me and re-offered me my job at exactly half my original salary and with increased work hours. I then realized that this was all a complete scam and that she just wanted to cut costs. Needless to say, I declined the ungenerous offer from Margolita Sachi R. That's Margaret Thatcher in Chinese. Thank me later. But I was in a jam. The company was yet to give me my work visa, so I was forced to leave China within two weeks and return to Australia to once again join the desolate ranks of the unemployed, sharing a meagre room with my wife in someone else's home and the shitty weather of Melbourne. Deja vu. And thus, yet again, began another period of enforced self-reflection where my self-belief was tested deeply. I was nearing 50 years of age and beginning to wonder if I was completely delusional. And let's face it, this wasn't an unreasonable self-query to be making after a decade of repeated failures. And yet, I persisted with my inner work and in taking wise action towards my envisaged future. So it was that after six months in Australia, I managed to get an interview from another university in China. Being the eternal optimist, I put a lot of time into preparing for the interview, which was to be online. My computer was on a desk facing a wall, and so I stuck numerous notes up there with lots of facts and details about the Chinese university and other information I thought might help me during the interview. But I do recall vividly on the day of the online hookup, my wife entered the bedroom, saw the notes plastered all over the wall and said flatly, you should stop trying so hard to be a professor. You're just suitable to be a high school teacher. I was not impressed and asked her to leave the room immediately. I knew she was just trying to save me from further rejection and failure, but the last thing I needed was to hear someone telling me who I was or wasn't. As it turned out, the interview went well, and the organization offered me the job. And this is how, in late 2016, I came to work at the College of Global Talents inside the Beijing Institute of Technology's Zhuhai campus. To be clear, I first taught academic English classes. Not exactly my bliss, because the dean was very conservative and wasn't interested in anything innovative. Actually, I'd approached him about teaching future studies, but he would have none of it. Then. 
One night, almost two years after my arrival, I had a dream that I was standing before the third floor elevator inside my university building, waiting for the elevator from the ground floor to arrive. When the doors opened, I saw myself walking out, wearing a suit and tie. In my dream diary, I wrote that, it seems I'm about to move up in the world. Shortly thereafter, the conservative college dean was removed from his position very unexpectedly, and the new dean had a much more progressive philosophy of education. I immediately saw opportunities to do the things I wanted to do, so started volunteering all over the place. In a matter of a couple of months, I was promoted from assistant to associate professor, became the coordinator of the college honours program, and was appointed to run a college platform called Global Talent 2050. Perhaps most importantly, for me, the Dean supported my desire to create and teach courses in future studies. It was all uphill from there. Well, mostly. When I began my job in China, I quickly discovered that being a professor at a university made a huge difference to my status. Suddenly, I was being invited to speak at international conferences and to be an advisor to various organizations. All that hard work I'd done while being outside the system was now finally paying off inside it. I traveled to cities like exotic Xishuangbanna in the far west of China, Chengdu, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Seoul, Bangkok, Chiang Mai, and Kuala Lumpur, and to other cities in Australia and Europe. I had become a globetrotting futurist, futuring about humanity, the mind, and technology. And today, in June 2024, I now work almost entirely as a futurist and have held my position of Associate Professor of Foresight and Strategy in Zhuhai, China for the past six years, with another two as an English professor. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. Now, I'm not suggesting it's all been fun and games. Any personal future you envisage that you successfully actualize will come with various responsibilities and pressures. There will be challenges, problems, and even crises that you will face and be asked to negotiate by the universe. And there will be failures even after success. That's life. And that will always be the case. And yep, that's distinction number nine. While these past few years have been a very successful and productive part of my life, I could tell you one or two recent horror stories in which the protagonist was me. But I will leave those tales for another fun-filled episode of Power and Presence. But I'm not quite done with this topic of how I became a globe-trotting futurist, as this is but part two of three. So do join me again soon here on the Power and Presence channel. In my next video, I will share several more key insights that I've gleaned from my journey, including how to develop your intuitive intelligence, how to rise above self-doubt, and how to stay lighthearted and have a rollicking good time even when the universe is kicking you in the teeth. And I promise there will be a few more personal stories that I think you'll enjoy. So see you then, soon, in the futures.